Good evening. Welcome to the first department head review with the Budget Finance Committee and Select Board. I'd like to call this meeting to order. First order of business. I'm Bob Gosen, Chairman of the Budget Finance Committee, and I will chair this meeting. Uh, we will start first with review of administration. Right. Thank you, Bob. So first thing I'd like to do is introduce our new finance director, Sharice Keach. She wanted to give a brief explanation of uh, some of the changes she's made in the, the budget, the budget development uh, methodology, information contained in the books, the addition of notes, and, and some other things that she's done. So the budget doesn't look exactly like it did last year. Sharice? Thank you, Bob and Dawn. Yeah, the new budget books, um, for starters, they have tabs for each of the uh, departments, which I think to be helpful when you're flipping through, you know, maybe a hundred page document. So there are tabs and uh, I wanna call it check stock, but it's not check stock, it's paper stock uh, in between the, the various departments. So that helps to, you know, ease flipping through uh, pages. The other uh, couple of changes are, as Don mentioned, um, there are spreadsheets that contain two years, two fiscal years of budget to actual. And then you have the current fiscal year budget and year-to-date expenditures. Keep in mind that's only through December 31st. So uh, I know Kathy had asked about that and we clarified that. So I wanna point that out. Your year-to-date expenditures only go through December 31st. Some of the uh, departments I try, and this is, you know, a lot of it's for me personally, because I, you know, don't always necessarily remember where an item was budgeted when you have so many various departments. So I do like to make little notations beside various uh, expenditures. So I've done that. Not on all of them, but some of them. And uh, the other um, thing is some of the things have been moved around from one department to another, and I can go into those, you know, as an overview, <clears throat> excuse me, as an overview, as an example, uh, registry of deeds was previously in the administration budget. I have now relocated that to the assessing budget. So that's one change. Another um, minor change is rescue billing that was previously under administration and that has been relocated to the uh, fire department because that's what it has to do with is public safety and fire and rescue department. And uh, another change would be <clears throat> building maintenance. As an example, in Nathan's public works department, he had two build building maintenance lines, one for district one and the other one just for public works. So what I did was relocate those all to uh, town buildings. So it's town-wide buildings, building maintenance with the exception of public safety because they have their own building maintenance line in their budget. So instead of having various building maintenance all over you know, the general operating budget, it's pretty centralized into town buildings. So that's just a couple of the changes. Um, I do like to regroup at the end of the budget process just to obtain feedback, you know, what worked well, what didn't work well, suggestions for improvement, I'm open to that, uh, what you'd like to see different. Um, I'm certainly, you know, willing to consider, you know, and accommodate uh, everyone. And so we will eventually regroup and I will ask for feedback, okay? That's all I have. Right, thank you, Sharice. You're welcome. Don, did you want to start with a statement? Yes, I have a, a brief statement, a brief outline of, uh, I guess you'd call it the really high points of the budget. We'll get into much more detail as we go department by department. But uh, I'd like to first start by saying that uh, I did issue a new budget memo today and the crush of getting things out the other day, you know, we, th we thought we had made things really clear. But when I read it this morning, or, or maybe it was yesterday morning, I said, geez, it's not so clear because at the addition of the issue of the library, really made sort of a double set of budgets for us. And so we, so there is a new cover letter that hopefully is clearer as to what's happening. So on, on that point, I'll, I'll tell you what the budget looks like at the start here uh, with the library and without the library. So the, so the gross budget without the library is up about $416,896 or 
or 7.4%. If you net out the revenues from that uh, gross budget without the library, you're looking at 251,623 or 7.4%. So, so an increase above what we normally would be presenting on initial budget. And then, the, then, of course, you have the gross budget with the library. So now you're adding a whole new department. You're taking on the whole library function. In that instance, you're looking at 551, 772 increase or 9.89%. Uh, and then if you net out the revenues, you're down to about 386, 499 or 11.36%. Um, and I can, you know, let, I guess Sharice explain why, it was, why it's up, but it's a, it's a little bit of an odd phenomenon. But anyhow, um, so we're looking at a significant budget increase over what we have normally seen. But what we also have is a, a significant change in the operations of the town. You know, we've added a number of functions. I think the town is at a point where we're seeing, um, you know, some, some new programming and, and some new directions. And, you know, I credit our chair, Teresa Sadak, with a lot of the leadership that has caused that to come about. And I think it's a, it's a positive stuff. And, uh, you know, the town is in very good fiscal shape. You know, we continue to maintain our AAA bond rating. Um, we are, you know, able to go from, you know, year to year without uh, borrowing tax notes. We have put a substantial amount of fund balance into the, you know, into the tax rate every year. And we intend probably to do that again uh, this year. So, so the town's in, in good fiscal shape. I think it's, it's operating well. We have great town employees. And, and uh, I, I think we've gone a little bit beyond the, what we used to call the so-called Raymond Way, which was just basic cable, you know, what we are statutorily required to do government. We're doing a lot more than that today, and I think we're doing it very well. So that's my kind of pitch on where, where we're going. But for the departments, department by department, the administration department, one of the things that's significant is we're going to go out and do an RFP for audit services. Now, the whole world, not only with the pandemic, but in the municipal world is so different. There's only a limited number of firms that even do auditing anymore. So we're going to put the RFP out, see what we get. But some, some towns are not getting any responses. And what's clear is we're going to uh, pay more. We're going to pay more for our audit. And uh, so that's a, that's, a, that's a big change. I mean, we used to have a, an environment where we had lots and lots of professional firms seeking town business. Uh, there are changes in the town clerk's elections budget. But I've learned from prior years, I'm going to let the town clerk detail those. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into those. Um, the, under contract fees and services, that, that was included in the FY, the roadrunner was included in contract fees and services in the FY 2022 budget. I think Cherise alluded to some moves in, in the budget. So that's been moved to the dues and publications budget for FY 2023. Um, so anyhow, uh, so that those are kind of the things that are happening in administration. And I, I probably should have had a percent by department uh, number to give you on each one, but I, I actually don't have that on my outline, but you have that all in your budget book. I, I believe the administration budget was, was down just slightly on account of those moves. And uh, so anyway, the, the code enforcement budget, of course, has a now a, an assistant uh, code officer. So that's a $71,000 increase in salaries. And uh, so that's, that's a significant difference there. But I can tell you that the addition of the second code officer has made an exponential difference in the efficiency of the office. We've gone from a position where we have seen, you know, a number of complaints about services to zero complaints about services. We're really, um, you know, taking care of the much increased flow of, uh, of work and the demand for permits. And we're also paying a very close attention to environmental uh, issues and violations, which is really essential. It's a very important thing for a town like Raymond that is so dependent uh, in our economy on our lakes and ponds. And so, so that's really been a very positive thing, the addition of the code enforcement officer, the second code enforcement officer or assistant. Uh, general assistance budget is up just slightly, uh, but on that one, you want to keep in mind that 70% of the budget is reimbursed by the state of Maine. And, uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but we think that a lot of what's happening with the general assistance budget is probably influenced by the pandemic. We hope and think that we'll go back to more normal levels, you know, post-pandemic, but who really knows? We have, of course, our Raymond Community Assistance Fund to help with, uh, you know, the, the needs of people who found, find themselves uh, struggling in this economy and, uh, and just generally at any time. So we've had great response from our citizens. We have people who put us on their, you know, annual giving plan. And so we 
we have funds. So if anybody's out there listening who is struggling, is, is having difficulty, if we can't help you through general assistance, we certainly can with community assistance. So, so, the, so that's one change. So in the pandemic, there has been a little bit of an upward uh, you know, trend on that. Raymond typically has very, very little general assistance, even very little demand for community assistance. But um, so we have, we have adequate funds in both areas. Uh, town insurance, the workers' compensation insurance is up due to the town's uh, mod rate or modification rate increasing from 1.14% to 1.39%. And we've had a significant change in wages. You know, we've added positions and so that's a, that's a difference there. Uh, under employee benefits, we have a $98,000 uh, increase. This uh, insurance expense this year, though, is reduced by the main small business uh, health insurance premium relief program. We're going to get $25,000 uh, from that. Uh, there is a, a proposal in here from Sharice and me about our retirement program. Now, we are uh, with the ICMA 457 Deferred Compensation Plan. And so what we have is a great uh, a plan that's based on gradients. So from zero to six months, you get 0%. From six months you know, through a year, um, it's 1%. And then 1% a year for five years up to 6%. So that's not a system that is, it was a system that was used in the past. It's been in our personnel policy. We haven't addressed it. In an effort to be more competitive, we are proposing that we take a look at that and you know, perhaps change it to once you pass probation, you would go to the 6% contribution. You know, I always encourage our younger employees to set money aside for their future. And unfortunately, some of them don't. So we're gonna make a bigger push at, in the HR department with Rita to try to orient people about the importance of saving for retirement. And uh, so that, that's a proposal we're making. It does come, of course, with a price tag. It could be up to $37,000 uh, if everybody participated. But as I say, we get not the greatest participation rate from our younger employees. Uh, so on to, uh, oh, okay. I wanna also say that this budget does not include anything related to the union negotiations, which are underway right now with the fire department. So we're gonna to have to factor those in and I'm not putting those in of course, because the Board of Selectmen has not considered any changes yet. They will be doing that shortly. So we'll have to, we'll have to make that adjustment, you know, if there's adjustment uh, to be made, but that's, I guess, to be determined in the future. On the TIF budget, that in budget is increasing 126,836. The primary increase um, is that we're using 116,000 of these funds for technology and, and CIP. Now this was Sharice's idea and it was a great idea and it's TIF qualified. It's something we hadn't thought of before. So $100,000 uh, that we had planned for the fiber network infrastructure project that Kevin has had ongoing and 16,000 for upgrades at the public safety building would be put into the TIF. Uh, we need to add a small amount of money, 2487 for the uh, Federal Highway uh, Administration and Federal Transit Administration they're requiring a 20% match from all of the uh, Greater Portland Comprehensive Transportation System communities or PACs. Now we have just a very small part of 302 in the PACs um, you know, district, but we're, we're part of the program. So we, we would have to raise that. And I guess the theory when it comes to PACs is that there are major transportation improvements that are made in Greater Portland that benefit Raymond residents and residents of the Lake region. But we're unlikely probably to see anything directly in Raymond from that. But that we do have to contribute. So uh, revenues, revenues is another area that's uh, I think pretty good news. We're up 165,000 in this proposed budget or 7.58%. And that's primarily due to a substantial increase in state revenue sharing. And uh, so we're making a conservative and I, I couldn't get Kurt LaBelle to go any higher. So our conservative estimate for new value is about $10 million. And so that's very low cons considering the permits that we've seen. And now remember the permits don't equal, you know, new value because some things don't start on time, you know, some things aren't finished in the, um, you know, in the fiscal year. And interestingly, there's a new phenomenon and that is that sometimes people are paying more to build things like they are paying to buy things than they are actually worth. That said, this, the stated permits that we have right now, and I, I'm sure Kurt would not want me to say this, but they're more like $30 million. Now, like I said, we, want, we aren't going to see $30 million. But I think we're going to see a, a stronger number than 10. But for the purposes of the budget, I'm telling you, we'll get 10 for certain. That's $141,000 in additional revenue that's not in the budget. Uh, we don't typically put that in, but that's, you know, growth we'll see. Um, 
Another thing is that we didn't put any money in for the library. And now the library has historically uh, raised um, a significant amount of, of uh, revenue. And so I think our appropriation was about 66,000 maybe. Um, and then the library had raised another 67, eight. So we need to really get a number from them. I don't have that number, but we'll need to plug that in. Perhaps when they make their presentation, we can talk with them. I didn't want to presume that they would raise all the money they did before. I didn't want to, because, you know, we want to have a good relationship. We want to make a smooth transition, assuming that the town approves this uh, warrant article to make the library a town department. And I'm, I'm really hopeful they will. And I'm really excited about this prospect. And this is another area where our chair, Teresa, has led the, led the band. And so it's something that has been kind of talked about, thought about since I've been here, which is 21 years. I remember going down and making the presentation actually to the library trustees when the board of selectmen were interested in it. And they kind of at that time said, ah, no, not, not right now. And so it's kind of been on the discussion table for 20 years. So it's a, it's a big deal. And I think it will be something that will be a, a good thing for the town, good thing for the library. It's going to be sustainability for the library. It's going to be the ability to broaden the program. It's going to be the ability to have the town, the employees there be town employees and, and so, and probably, ex, you know, the expansion of hours and services. So a lot of good things could come out of it. But that's subject, of course, to a vote. We'll have to see how that, that goes. The fire department budget is up about $240,000. Uh, and uh, that's primarily in wages. And we did put the recommendation of the fire chief that's related to the union negotiations into the budget. Of course, that is subject as well as the benefits to the board of selectmen vote. But we, we did put the, that number in that he's recommending. And uh, so, so anyway, the, the, the budget also includes two new full-time positions. These are firefighter EMT positions, but the public safety department, Kathy Goslin, I'm guessing, has le led this one, as well as many other successful grant applications for the town. They put in an application for a number of positions through the uh, Federal SAFER program, which would pay the cost in full for the new positions for a three-year period. So if we're successful, at least to the tune of two people and with the SAFER grant, that, that increase would be covered by that, that grant for that period of time. Now, at the end of the three years, you can decide whether you're going to continue or whether you're going to, you know, not continue. You're not committed to retain people. But I'm telling you that we need the staff. We need the, the, the people in the fire department. So the likely outcome of the safer grant would be three years federal funded and then assumption by the town, hopefully. Um, so on to the, uh, the, so if the voters approve, assuming the operational cost of the library, the uh, increase of the proposed budget there will be $135,000. Now, once again, I say that's not with any revenues. We've got to talk to them about what their revenues would be. Um, and I don't know why we've got this this way, but I guess it's probably the way they fall in the book, correct, Therese? Now we're going back to debt retirement. So we have debt retirement, including the, the financing of a new fire apparatus, a rescue pumper for $500,000 with a term of 10 years. The new apparatus replaces a 23-year-old a squad truck, and that's a 1999 Freightliner that we bought used that had come out of the South. I can't remember if it was Kentucky, uh, but anyway, we bought it through a dealer in Connecticut, I remember. And the 20-year-old uh, utility vehicle, 2003 Ford F-350 that I remember when that was brand new. So now that's coming up on its 20th birthday. So those two will go away, be replaced by this one combination truck. And then it also extends the life of our engine one because that, that won't, I guess, be, you know, put into service as often as it does, as it gets put into service today. So two trucks into one and preserves the life of, an, of another. Um, the capital improvement budget increasing 35,000, equipment CIP 10,000, setting aside 100,000 for the revaluation. Uh, municipal facilities, Nathan would like $50,000 to renovate the public works uh, building on Main Street. That would be for an office space for the um, recreation director. And there was talk at one time, but Sharice tells me this has now shifted somewhat and we'll have to have an internal discussion about it. But there was talk about adding an, an administrative assistant. But now, now it seems to be, let's share Melissa, who is already working for me, working for the um, assessing office. That's her primary role. And um, then she's, you know, working theoretically for Nathan, although he doesn't, you know, take as full of advantage of her as he could. And some of that is due to her location, I'm sure. 
But so now we have Joe, the public works director, Joe, Joe our recreation director, the public works director, the town manager, the assessor, all with one administrative assistant. And I think what they'd like to do is build a space and, and have her down there, but I'm a little dubious of, of, the, of the sharing part, but the space, office space, right now the rec director is sharing Nathan's not very grand office that's in the back of the fire station. I don't know what it was when it was a fire department, but I remember that it, maybe it was just part of the, uh, part of the room there, Dennis. I don't, I don't remember, but it's kind of been blocked off now and it's, Nathan has a little corner there. So, so they don't have great office space. So that's what that one's about. Um, the paving CIP, Nathan wants to increase that by $100,000. Now, so probably the worst time in the year to be doing, uh, worst time in the year is to be doing paving because of the run-up in the cost of uh, bitumen, which is related directly to the run-up in cost in asphalt, uh, um, fuel oil rather. And so asphalt and fuel oil are directly connected. And, uh, but what are you gonna do? We wanna keep on track. We wanna keep our program moving forward. He has a program. And so we've made great progress. I think excellent strides in bringing the roads forward in their overall condition. And so that's what's being proposed there. Uh, the technology, uh, CIP is decreased by 90 as we're putting that into the, uh, the TIF. And uh, that's, as I said, for the fiber network infrastructure project. So there are a number of other discussion items that are not in the budget that I cut from the budget because I don't know is the things that, we, that we're gonna do, but I think the things we ought to think about and talk about, they were departmentally proposed ideas. And of course, one was coming about setting aside money for the Jordan small renovation. Now we are gonna have that school in, in five years. And so the thought was maybe we should start setting money away into a capital reserve. A countervailing view would be to say, let's, when we get there, let's you know, maybe plan for what we are doing when we get closer, you know, hire an architect, engineer, whatever we need to look at the building and, and decide what it would need to go into municipal use. But then at the time we actually do the work, perhaps a bond would be the way to go. That's been the way we've been doing it lately. However, the idea of a capital reserve is sort of a traditional way of doing it as well. So there was a discussion about whether we should do that. Uh, likewise, Nathan's very interested in a public works facility at Plains Road, a consolidated public works facility. Right now he's spread over three facilities. And so it makes sense to have that public works facility in one location for a lot of reasons. And we have the space there. Uh, right now we have basically an office trailer that we were able to get from BSA that came out of the uh, Army uh, Innovative Readiness Training Program. So that gives them a spot there to be during storms and to have a, a lunchroom. Then we've got the uh, District 2 station, which has you know work bays and has a parts room. And I think it may even have a little cubby of a workspace, office space. And then we come back to the fire station, the former fire station on Main Street that has become a public works building as well. So we've got public works spread all over town and. And he'd, he'd like to see at some point there be a consolidated modern building. And you don't have to go too far around us to see examples of that being done. Uh, I would point to New Gloucester most recently, I think. And uh, so, so anyhow, that's something he'd like to see. We have the comprehensive plan update. If we can ever get anybody on the committee, Sue has advertised and advertised, and we haven't gotten much response to our advertisements. We have just a handful of people, maybe not even a handful of people who are interested. But if we do get that up and running, we're gonna need some money there. And then once again, a big question is what amount of revenue from the library would we put back in the budget so that we're gonna to have to decide that I think with them and, and you know, and, and it's, it's gonna be a partnership and we're gonna to have to decide, you know, how this thing's all gonna work and look. And so that, that I think we can start to do when they come and make their presentation. So anyway, if the impact on the mill rate is estimated to be an increase of about 55 to 70 cents, not factoring in any use of fund balance. Factoring in the uh, fund balance um, uh, of 200 to 300,000 uh, would, uh, you have uh, increased the, the mill rate, but I think it would be decrease the mill rate to 25 uh, to 40 cents. So that's what we're looking at, but it's all very preliminary. I think there's a lot of uh, changes we can make in this budget but we kind of wanted to throw it all at you. And I think Joe came in a little late, but it's not our typical budget. It's not our, what we want to give you. It's, it's kind of the reality of where we're at with a number of the decisions that I think have been very positive decisions that we've made. And, and the town is, uh, you know, changing, moving forward, doing some things that are beyond the basic cable services. 
And uh, so I, I guess with that, we're, we would like to speak with you about it department by department and, and answer any questions you might have about the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Um, I guess I'd like to go through each of these areas and see if the numbers prompt questions. Uh, we go to the, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. You will be acknowledged and you will be able to ask the question. So first we're gonna start with administration. Sue has some changes. I, I think Sue would probably love to tell you about her changes. Do you want to do that, Sue? Oh, yes. I was sitting here with bated breath. I, I um, didn't do it this year, right? right? Yes, you did good. I'm very proud. Okay. Um, the we I have a, a few things in there. One is um, for the elections piece. piece. For one, um, this is a gubernatorial year, which means a primary and a um, candidate election in November. Those have been trending more absentee, so the cost of absentees have gone up a bit, um, and postage doesn't ever drop, if anything. Um, and if we do vote the town meeting warrant via uh, ballot, then that costs quite a bit more to send out the absentees. So, so I've had to increase some of the costs there, but the biggest increase in the elections budget is um, because of the voting booths, I'd like to replace four of the quad booths. When I originally bought the uh, white ones that we have, um, it was from a main based company who was going to be able to give us parts, maintain them, etc. The owner and founder of it uh, developed cancer and died. So that company is gone. So that's why I'm looking at uh, replacing them with, I have to go with a different company, so I can't just get pieces. Um, and that's almost $4,000 I'm asking for for that. Um, records con uh, conservation, um, I think a few of you have been in to see what has I've been able to have done to our oldest uh, vital books, which are death, marriage, and uh, um, yes, the other thing, births, um, records. Um, the oldest book it goes back to the late 1700s. It's all old handwritten script and it's been completely conserved. So it's every page is encased in mylar and is touchable at this point because we can't hurt the parchment that it's actually, the book is made of. And it's also been scanned so I can do searches, genealogy searches on uh, digitally instead of having to get the books out. And if anyone would like to see them, by all means come in. So I'd like to continue that process um, to start doing, uh, there's one more book of births to be done and then to start doing some of the town meeting minutes and documents that have to be again, permanently kept that are getting more and more fragile as we all get older. Um, another piece is equipment leasing. The um, fellow that comes out to service our photocopiers is impressed that they're still running. Um, he has spent about eight hours on one of them a week or so ago. And um, thankfully it keeps, they keep on a chugging, but we really do need to get those replaced. And the um, cost for that would be a $3,400 to uh, replace both of them with a lease to own five year lease. Uh, so it isn't just a single year commitment, but it also, we don't have to lay out all the money at once either. Um, the town report, I haven't broken it out in the past separately. That's something that uh, Sharice and I worked on and the, um, sorry, my staff is leaving. Um, that usually does cost around a thousand dollars to print the town report. I don't print that many anymore. I think it's either 250 or 300 copies. Uh, because most people uh, look, seem to look at it online, which is a better way to look at the pictures. Some of the pictures are gorgeous and they're in color, but they're only in color online. And then last but probably not least is the tax billing. We've got, I've been requesting roughly $5,000 to do the tax bills uh, to send those out. We had an experiment last year where we sent out 
the bills ourselves. Um, we wanted to try it because um, the company, company or we've used a couple of different companies since I've been here, but they all send it, send our addresses through a uh, USPS approved software to standardize them. And they run them through an NCOA process, which is National Change of Address, uh, a NICSI process. And I, well, I, I will continue that there's a lot of processes they do that are all USPS based. In the process, they do change our addresses and then mail them out and we get a lot of undeliverables and a lot of people complaining that they don't get their tax bills. So, and on the whole, we tend to have the most recent mailing addresses. So we sent them to what we had on file without that and got fewer undeliverables, fewer complaints that people didn't get their bills. It does cost us the full uh, first place class rate to mail them out. But since we don't have to remail as many and we didn't have the expense of having someone else stuff our envelopes and, and get the paper cuts from folding that we got, then um, it really seemed to save us money and be a lot less aggravation on the citizens as well as us. So that's why we're looking at continuing that. Um, in the next bill, part of that is to get a folder so we can cut down on our paper cuts and make that part of the process a bit more efficient, but, but we're pretty good at it on the whole. So I do, I am asking for a number of things. In total, it's not a, not a huge capital expense, but all of this stuff adds up, I know. Thank you, Sue. And so another another change you see here is the uh, rescue billing. I think Sharice talked about moving things around to where they more appropriately fit. And so she's, uh, I think, correct in saying that that's something related to the public safety department. So she's moved that from administration to public safety. Thank you. Joe? Thanks. Um, one thing I notice on your, your summaries for each department is there's no percentage increase or decrease being shown. So you got to kind of do the math in your head. Actually, um, Joe, if I could speak to that, you have a two page document. It's titled Appropriation Summary. Where do I see that? Looks like this. Okay. That has your percentage and dollar amount increases. Where is that in my booklet? Um, pretty second close tab. to the beginning. Second tab. Second tab? Second tab, appropriation summary. All right. Yeah, we, before, before you, um, I guess, checked in, Sharice talked about some of the changes that she made. So it is looking different it's definitely different than what it has been. And so we apologize for that. And she also talked about if, if, if it's not something that's working for you and you think that, you know, that we ought to re revert to something different, we're open and always wanting to hear feedback. So there were some changes which she went through. I don't know if you, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, MMA dues. MMA dues are in the budget, but I think at one point we talked about looking at that and, and deciding you know, what sort of uh, level of service we were getting for dues paid. So they're in the budget, but that they were put in the budget because the Board of Selectmen voted to put them in the budget. I mean, that's a pretty substantial amount, $8,000 for a town of 4,500 people or 4,600 people. Had they gone hey, up in their dues structure? They did go up a number of years ago. I'm not sure if they've gone up uh, since. And that was one of the points along with my, my argument was always it's uh, along with the money the primary thing that you get from mma is you get the insurance programs you know the health insurance the property casualty risk pool and insurance but we we privatized that so i'm going to say yes it went up and and no we're not using those programs still so hey ralph yeah uh the reason we put that into the budget last year was there was a discussion, uh, there was a couple of discussions that went around there. Uh, one of which was we thought that there was going to be an overall savings to us in legal because of what we were getting out of, what we would be able to get out of MMA, quote unquote, for free. Uh, from what I understand, Sue, so the 
you're, you're not, you know, you're not getting what you thought you were going to get out of that. So, I mean, that's, that's the biggest, the biggest thing that we were looking at in there. So that's why we entered it in last year. And I, I would, I would suggest that we're not getting what we really want to get out of there, or we're not getting much desirable result out of there. So I would say that that, that would be something we want to drop. Well, and I haven't had many instances where I've needed to contact them this year and they won't advise us on specific um, specific instances or, or situations. They'll tell us overall what the law says and whatnot. So there are there have been times in the past when I've needed them for election petitions, things along that line pertaining to the municipality, but we haven't had much use for that this year. Now, this, this is this is just an anecdote, but the other day we had an issue related to, uh, you know, general assistance and or welfare question, and we were trying to get an answer out of the GMA, uh, the, out of the MMA uh, legal desk. They have a GA uh, specialist there. And uh, now, granted, it was, you know, we started in the morning and we tried to get an answer by the end of the day and we didn't get a call back. And so sometimes, you know, you do need to get information in a timely manner. And we did not that day. And I'm not saying that would happen every time, but it was frustrating. And I, the reason why we went that way was our town attorney was off on a school vacation with his family in Florida. And so they didn't have anybody else there who had the specialty to at Bernstein because of the school vacation week to assist us. And so we went to MMA legal and, you know, came up short there too. Therese? Yes, so the average increase in the municipal dues was 3% and that's across the board. They, they don't prorate it, uh, the increase based on your level of services that you utilize. I mean, it's not like we're using them to the full potential of you know participating in the risk pool for property and cas casualty insurance, workers' comp insurance. We do not uh, have the main municipal employees health trust program. Uh, so they, they're basically just, you know, levying all municipalities an average of 3%, not prorating it based on your level of service. Uh, so yeah, the increase, Ralph, was 3%, average of 3%. The other, the other thing you get from them, and I, I don't want to get too deep into this, but you get their lobbying efforts. And so whether you agree or disagree, that's what you get also. And I see Joe, yeah, smiling a little bit. So... Uh, the other thing that, you know, we do benefit from is the cost of the specialized training that, you know, a lot of us do participate in. We do get, a, you know, a little bit of a discount off training sessions. And, you know, when we advertise an RFP for, you know, say we're selling a piece of equipment or we're going out for an RFP for auditing services, uh, that would be, you know, a, a service free of charge by being a member of being municipal. Um, and then, as we talked about a little bit, the legal services, um, you know, but they just, you know, it's very general and what they will provide for information. They would not defend you if anything came up in court. Um, that's the reason why you'd want to consult with your own attorney. But that's just a little bit of information and background on me municipal. Thank you, Sharice. Any other questions on administration? <clears throat> you know, uh, in regard to the photocopier lease, I mean, you've got that in as a lease to own. If we're going to go down the road of leasing, are we better off not to do a lease to own, just do a, just, just do a lease so that you can, you're going to then uh, churn the equipment in five years anyway. So you're going to, you know, essentially you're going to be going to new equipment every five years, but it's picked up under a lease type setup. I mean, it may end up being the same amount, but you know, if, if you're going after five years and you're now you have a five-year-old equipment that you bought, and instead of just continuing the lease after, you know, continuing a new lease after that with new equipment. Well, that's yep. that's that's one thing you could definitely look at. But I'll ask Sue how long we kept those machines with almost no repairs. About fifteen years. After so after the ten more years after the five, but it's a, it's a legitimate way to do it for sure. You're going to have up to date equipment, reliable equipment. But we've actually had pretty good luck with copiers, and that this is the second set I've been through here, and the the first ones that I inherited also lasted a similar amount of time. 
Yeah, I only looked at lease to own because that's what we've done in the past. I certainly can get uh, figures for leasing straight out. Right. Joe? No. Lease to own usually only has a dollar buyout at the end of the year, at the end of the lease. Right. So if you, you buy it for a dollar and you get another five years out of it, you do pretty well. Right. And what, that's what we've been doing, except we get more like 10. Right. Yeah. But you never know. You can get a bad copy or like anything else. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for administration? Move on to assessing. Who will be presenting this assessment? John? Uh, well, the big the big issue in assessing is I think that she you've moved the uh, revaluation out of assessing, correct? Uh, correct. The yeah. um, the FY twenty two budget actually had hundred thousand put in the operating budget and not in where it really should be in the CIP as a you know a capital reserve deposit. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the biggest change. Um, Kurt's contract is getting a small increase uh, starting in October. And um, we have prorated uh, wages for his administrative assistant, which is Melissa. And we moved the registry of deeds, um, invoicing or expense expenditure, which includes recording discharges of municipal quick claim deeds. And not discharges, recording municipal quick claim deeds and discharging liens, as well as, you know, when they're doing a record search for transfers on who's the titled owner, uh, that's all falls under the registry of deeds. He did put in, uh, Kurt did put in a slight increase in the vision fees. Um, and then the tax billing that we're looking to do in house as Sue had previously alluded to, um, that has been uh, transferred over to the assessing budget because it's, you know, has to do with tax billing. Uh, so the overall, the overall uh, impact of that budget is, well, you know, you're factoring out the 100,000, um, taking that out. So it's, it's, uh, my hearing Joe say something? No. Okay. <laughs> So we had 60, it would be, you know, going from 61,000 up to 79,000, roughly speaking, with those various changes. Any questions for assessing? I would like to say something there, and that is that we have an excellent assessor in Kurt Lavelle, and the contract has really worked out well for us. And so, uh, you know, he divides his time between us and, but um, primarily another another community gardener. And so they they have him, uh, um, you know, most of the time, and we have him as we need him. And we had have had, you know, great support people here, and that have gotten the training to be able to answer the day to day questions. So it's really worked out well for the town. I think we've gotten a, a really good person, a highly qualified person and uh, been able to do that in an inexpensive way for quite a period of time. Any other questions? Let's move on to code enforcement then. Hello, oh, Alex. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. Good. Um, all right, so uh, I don't have a whole lot uh, changing. Obviously, Don already touched on the big changes or the big change, which is an assistant code officer. Um, we made a lot of changes in the last year in the office just to fix some problems that had been ongoing um, for quite a few years. Um, and like Don said, things are going uh, really well right now, um, very smoothly, and we fixed a lot of the major issues. So 
Um, you know, the big change uh, is the salary line um, with uh, you know, bringing on an assistant code officer. And then um, we've also made the administrative assistant position uh, full-time. That was previously a part-time position. Uh, it's now full-time. We'd like to actually bring it up um, to 36 hours a week to give a little bit more time for um, some of the administrative tasks that need to get done that haven't been getting done the last few years. Um, so that's, that's really the biggest change. Um, other than that, you know, we had to move some stuff around software wise just to, you know, increase the efficiency. Um, last year we started using a new uh, online permitting company that I did a kind of a phase implementation with. Um, now we're kind of on to phase two. We've been using it for about a year now and that's working really well. Um, and then the other big, big expense has been uh, general code. Um, and that's a company that we have contracted with to take over management of our major land use ordinances. And they're on the second half of the codification process um, of the land use and shoreland zoning ordinances, uh, going through them entirely and doing a full review, reformatting them all, not changing anything um, in the ordinances, but just reformatting them and correcting any errors that we found along the way. Um, so they'll do a, few, a full legal review of those ordinances and provide us with a pretty substantial document on all of the issues they found that they can't change. That's not just a, a minor um, tweak. Uh, and that's a list that we'll use to correct the ordinances for the next few years. Um, so that's a pretty exciting project. Um, my goal would be to put a little bit more into that over the next five years and have all of the land use ordinances be on that system. Um, and uh, it's an online based system. It, it works very well. Um, and I did have experience with, with this company in Casco and I was pleased with uh, working with them there. That just so you guys know is something that they're looking to have those two major ordinances done by July. Uh, it is likely going to involve um, town meeting acceptance. So I don't know how we're gonna work that into the time frame because it'll miss this year's town meeting obviously. Um, it's looking like it may be a 2023 thing but that's something you guys will see more of down the road. Um, so that's in there and something that, you know, it is going to be an annual expense of $1,195. It may go up some years, depending on the amount of ordinance amendments. And if we decide to tack on additional documents, but that's kind of the base fee. Um, other than that, it was just some minor tweaks to clean stuff up, organize things a little bit better. Um, and we are increasing the projected revenue um, to 100,000, which to be honest is pretty conservative or we're going to be over 100,000 this year. I think we had budgeted 87, um, approximately off the top of my head. And uh, so I think we'll be, we'll definitely be over 100,000 this year. We'll probably be over 100,000 next year. I just didn't wanna to go too, too high with it. Um, and I do also anticipate some, hopefully fingers crossed, some uh, enforcement revenues, which I believe is going to the general fund, but, um, and that's obviously not uh, promised or a guarantee, but uh, hopefully that's something that, you know, we, we do see come in as well, but. Also not budgeted in any way, it's just going to right. fund balance. So yep. it'd be a benefit to the town yep. that way. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much all I have, um, unless you guys have questions. Joe. Alex, where are we with uh, any backlogs? Are we, are we caught up? Um, no, the way we've been doing it now is, so we're reviewing permits as they come in. And basically we have, uh, we went from a four to six week permit turnaround to about a one to two week permit turnaround, uh, which is where we wanna be. I don't wanna see it any more than two weeks. So um, we do have some that are currently longer than two weeks, but it's not, our fault, I'll say. It's because they didn't submit all the information and we say, hey, you need to send in more stuff and it takes them a week or two to get it back to us. So that does still happen. But um, with the ball in our court, I'll say I definitely try to keep it less than two weeks. And I think right now we're, we're definitely doing that. Some of them are actually a week or less. Um, so those get all scheduled out at the beginning of the week um, with Chris and I. We break, break them out as they come in. And then whatever we have left over for holes on the schedule, we fill with 
um, permits from previous years. Uh, we have, I have a list of what we have outstanding um, and we're chipping away at it each week. So we're kind of continuing to focus on some of that back backlog permit uh, stuff that's out there. Fortunately, most of the big um, you know, permits that were pending, we've heard from and we've taken care of. So it's a lot of small stuff that people submitted, like mostly tree removal, to be honest, and they submit it and then they just never call back. Um, so it's just catching up on those. I, I would tell you that my phone has stopped ringing. Uh, for a while, I felt like the super code secretary that I would you know, turn my coin because everybody was calling to try to get relief from me. And then I'd put them, you know, push those to the top of the pile because, you know, I believe in expedient, you know, and efficient service and you know, of course thorough as well. And so I, I think although the backlog may not be completely gone for some of these permits that may require additional information or, you know, somebody may have lost a, you know, possible interest in, but we're going to get them all nailed down and we don't have anybody complaining and things are, that come in are now being processed in a workmanlike way in a reasonable time frame given the amount of information that you have to get and analyze and then you know process the permits. So I'm saying that things look pretty good to me. I'm not getting calls. Sue? And I, I'm going to echo what Don said. We aren't having people come in here ticked before they get here. Um, they come in and we are able to send them out to Kirsten or to Alex or Chris and it's been, with a few notable exceptions of people that don't really like part of the process, I haven't heard anyone saying that things are late, they aren't hearing back, we aren't hearing any of that anymore. So it's been really nice. Since you brought up Kirsten, she is exceptional in my view, really good, really good. She's a keeper. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. That makes and a big difference, you know, she's the face, the first face you see in the code office and actually in the back room now, given our tight quarters, you kind of almost literally run into her when you come into the back room. And she has really helped, I think, a lot with the public relations piece. Oh yeah, definitely. I have a question, Alex. How are you guys moving around town to do your business? What are you driving? Is there a need to replace anything? No, um, I'll... I'll we still have the donated Tahoe that we got probably 10 years ago. We solved a poor, unfortunate person. He was a great guy. He, he had a problem though. He had too many cars and nobody in the family wanted the car. So we took the car and we've been using it happily for about 10 years. That's the older Tahoe. The second Tahoe was from our friends at Cumberland County. It's a retired police cruiser. Nathan had to do an upper end uh, rebuild of the engine. There was a little bit of problems with that, but because it's a complicated process, but he got it sorted out. And I guess I'll let Alex talk about how they go, but I, that's where we got them. One was, well, they're both, they were both donated vehicles. Yeah, and it's working fine for now. The way we've set it up is Chris does a bulk of the out of office uh, inspection site meetings. And I'm primarily in the office uh, meeting with people, answering phone calls, reviewing permits. So um, a lot of the times we have one vehicle out um, I expect as, you know, nicer weather gets here and things pick up, um, you know, summer residents return, there'll probably be instances where both of us are out of the office doing inspections. Um, but fortunately this winter, we haven't had a lot of that. So, um, I do think, and Don's probably the better person to answer this. I've kind of been out of the, the vehicle discussions. I think there's a longer term plan on what we're going to do moving down the road, but, uh, it's just not something that I'm. Uh, I guess aware of at this point, but what, what Nathan wants to do, Nathan, the public works department has sort of been the overarching, you know, department that takes care of all of the motor vehicles. And now we have a, you know, a mechanic, which has been a great addition to the town. And so I think Nathan's plan is to budget for, uh, you know, a new vehicle, but we did get this. Uh, well, Nathan and I found this thing at the, 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 the county's, uh, uh, I guess, facility. And so, we took advantage of it, and I, I think with two code officers, it makes sense to be able to have them both have a, you know, an identifiable town vehicle. You know, we got a, we get a lot of positive about that in terms of people are, you know, not when somebody pulls up in an unmarked car. I mean, Kurt, for instance, has been using the Bolt, the electric car, because you know it kind of conveys a, a sense of you know mission and purpose and authority for the town. And so, you know, the cars have been 
relatively speaking, not, not anything that's cost us a ton of money. I think on account of Alex's time in the office, we're not even spending the kind of fuel that we would have spent, we would spend if you had two of them in the field. But I think it's essential to have somebody in the office a lot of the time, and that's what we have. And so, so I think in the future, we'll probably budget for, to answer the question about the car, we'll budget for one and then the other car, but, but it's not gonna be in this budget. Unless we can find somebody who'll give us another car, if you wanna, we're always willing to help you take the problem off your hands, like give us a free car, we'll take it, if it suits us. Any other questions for code enforcement? Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Let's move on to general assistance. Yeah, so general assistance, as I said in the brief overview, and there really isn't a whole bunch to say, it's up, you know, on account of the pandemic, we think. We think it'll come down post pandemic, you know, who knows, but I, I believe it will. And 70% reimbursement from the state, important point there. The other thing I would say it's related to general assistance. I hit on it in the introduction is that the community assistance, we've been using more of that during the pandemic. And Jenny, our general assistance administrator, I think Sue would agree, she's right out there with her. She's done a really good job. Any questions for general assistance? Well, and one other piece about that, and Don touched on it in his opening comments, but um, we have had some very generous citizens give donations of Hannaford cards, of gas cards, of um, monies for the community uh, assistance. And it's the response of the town without any kind of advertising or asking for it, just the goodness of their hearts has really been very impressive to see. Yeah, as I said, I think people, some people have put us on their annual, you know, giving, the charitable giving list. And then there are just people who, because of the pandemic, as Sue said, they've just been bringing in these gift cards and then gifts of cash. It's really been really good, really good. Um, Other questions? Let's go on to town insurance. Cherise has her hand up. Sorry, I didn't, I wasn't looking up. Go it's ahead. okay, Bob. Not used to raising my hand, but uh, anyways, the other, I didn't know if um, perhaps for the next meeting, um, would you folks be interested in knowing what the balance is in the uh, community assistance fund? I think back along, someone had asked, you know, where, where we stood with it. And we have like, Sue had mentioned we have had a couple of very substantial donations and um, would you be interested in knowing what that balance is for the next meeting, perhaps? Sure, oh, I would. Yeah, maybe knowing the balance and what the expenditures have been for a couple of years. Sure, I can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move on to insurance. You want to take that one, Cherise? Sure. sure. So uh, insurances, you know, anybody that's been in the insurance field, I know Rolf is, and I'm a former insurance, licensed insurance producer, you know, both personal lines and commercial lines. Um, they do go up. They generally do not come down. Uh, I have I have just basically done an average increase of 8%. That's probably very modest um, or conservative. And um, one of the things that, you know, is impacting it is certainly with the additional staff uh, and the modification rate going from 1.14 up to 1.39%. You know, the, the increase in staff, and the rate classification, you know, when you're talking fire department, that's certainly higher than a clerical position that has a lower rate classification when it comes to workers' comp premium. So that's where you're seeing the big influx is basically the workers' comp. That's all I really have to reference in that particular budget. If anybody has any questions. Go. So, so we're seeing a 40% increase in workers' comp. Have you had some 
cases or? We did have, because uh, Rita's the one that files the workers' comp uh, claims on behalf of the town. And, you know, I've only been there six months, so not real um, privy to that information. But because um, loss of indemnity is where you typically, you know, will see an influx in your um, premium. If we can't get our people back to work, that's where you're going to see the, you know, the, the claims go up. It's not so much the medical, it's the loss of wages. Uh, and I don't know if the town has this. Um, where I came from, we did have a light duty or return to work um, policy whereby you know if there was a position that they could come back with the approval of their physician um, that they could perform the duties of you know that like a light duty transfer so to speak and just to get them back in the workforce it's good for their morale and still feel like they belong you know still included in the town I don't know if we have such a policy but and you know, we did have one fairly substantial claim and it, you know, it does look back, you know, the loss runs, uh, I don't know if it's three or even five years for workers' comp. Maybe Rolf can help me out on that. I think it's five years for workers' comp loss runs. But yes, that's basically it. Okay. So the basic answer to your question is yes, we have had some adverse experience. And that's also true in the motor vehicle field in which we're working on trying to improve there as well with our motor vehicle insurance. We've had, you know, some, 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 you know, ash, accidents and crashes, some, some at fault, some not at fault. So we've had, we've had a number of, uh, a number of those in, in both public safety and public work. So. Any other questions for town insurance? Thank you. Employee benefits. You want me to take that one as well, Don? It looks like the insurance. The, you go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is another one of those changes that I made. Um, you know, in this particular department or cost center, however you want to view it, is to segregate dental insurance from the health insurance. I just think that by segregating it, it will be easier to track, um, you know, the increases from one year to the next. So I did, did pull that out. Uh, <clears throat> I did reference, uh, we did change plans uh, for 2022, and it was a, a, a really a minor change as far as premiums and benefits and all of that. And for health insurance, I did leave the health reimbursement account, re, you know, levels the same. I really didn't want to, you know, make any drastic changes there until we, you know, filled this new insurance plan out. And we are getting that small business premium relief through April of 2023. So we have 10 months of that and it equates to about 25,000. So that's substantial. So when you look at the health insurance um, line going from 475 in the current budget up to 490, you know, where we are looking to, you know, we are in the budget, we're looking to add the two positions for the fire department. Uh, it also factors in uh, potentially, um, not in this particular budget, but once we get to the library budget, they have built in their budget health and, and um, health and retirement and dental benefits. So it's, it's basically just projecting a, a little bit of a higher premium come 2023. Um, but I think we took a very minimal hit for, for this year. Uh, Let's see, what else might have changed a little bit? Retirement, as we had mentioned previously, uh, we, uh, both Don and I were, you know, talking about potentially making a change to our personnel policy and amendment to the retirement plan in that uh, to maintain competitiveness in the municipal market, we did do a little survey of local municipalities as to see what they offer for retirement and, you know, to take up to six years to get to 6%, um, you know, that's a long time to, you know, get to a retirement level or where they should be. So 
we anticipated questions coming from the, the budget finance committee and the selectmen, and we did a survey of some local municipalities to find out what they offer. So if you're interested in knowing what those are, I can tell you. Uh, but on average, they're between four and 6%. And they either start at the date of hire or uh, after 60 days. And uh, so, yeah, they're either, uh, let's see, Casco is 3% match as of date of hire. Poland is 4% match of date of hire. Naples is 5% match as of date of hire. Wyndham, 6% match, date of hire. And let's see, Standish, after the first full year of employment, a 6% match. Um, and then I also have Gray's number as well, and it's 6% after 60 days of employment. So our proposal um, or suggestion to, you know, for the selectmen to consider as a potential amendment to the personnel policy would be to uh, offer a 6% contribution, employer contribution, after the employee has satisfactorily um, passed their probation period of six months. Right. And so that, that sample you did too, mm -hmm. by the way, is a, and I think it's great because it gets some of the communities that probably people mm -hmm. would want to compare with. But if you were to take the uh, communities that are actually in our KMA labor market, it would skew much closer to the 6% on average. So a lot of those communities were communities to the mm -hmm. West that are, you know, that some are, but most of those are not in the KMA survey. So the cost associated with making such a change is about thirty-seven thousand um, dollars. If everybody took full advantage. If they took full advantage, correct. And we're trying. We're actually trying to indoctrinate our employees about the importance of saving for their futures. I mean, Rolf. Rolf knows this. I don't know if you want to say something, Rolf, but. I mean, uh, you know, I, I advocated for that. You know time and time again is, you know, they, the time for them to get into it is when they can first get into it because, uh, you know, if they're not saving for their future, they're, they're putting themselves behind the whole, the whole eight ball. It, you know, and I certainly, I don't have a problem with, start, you know, with starting it earlier and, you know, uh, and, and doing that, doing that match earlier, because if that's going to, if that's going to help them, it's going to, you know, it helps everybody else down the road. You know, even from the standpoint of uh, statewide GA and things like that, you know, people that are are putting some money away are going to help themselves down the road, and and you know the, the differential in what we pay, you know, to the budget there isn't that great when you look at the benefits on the other side. It, you know, it, and I would really push for them, you know, to try and get more and more people maxing it out. Yeah, the other thing uh, that I like to point out is the administrative complexity of trying to, you know, maintain such a tiered approach for retirement for the employer contribution. It just, you know, it means, you know, maintaining some type of system where you have to track people's date of hires and their anniversary dates and, you know, make sure that you're making those changes in payroll accordingly. And, you know, if you get six different levels, you know, and 30, unfortunately, we only have 30 full-time employees, but heaven forbid, you know, if we were, you know, 50 plus, um, it's, it's an administrative, you know, task to, to do. So this would also, you know, free up some time of reader and having to, you know, track those, you know, all she would need to do is make sure they pass their probation period and then right from the get-go program them. Uh, the six percent. If you want to have it to be a match, you know my my experience with four fifty seven plans, a deferred compensation plan, is is that it doesn't necessarily need a match. When I think of a match, an employer match, I think of a four hundred one k. But that's totally up to the board on how they want to want to structure it. They'd probably like to see the employee uh, participate on their own to be able to receive the employer portion as well. So I, I think that we want to do the match. And if we're going to do this, that we want to have a match. Yeah. I mean, what I, I would almost advocate for as well would be a, you know, a forced opt out rather than an opt in and say that right. you know, when, when you, when you start, you will be started <clears throat> at this rate. You can, you can increase it to this, but you will start at this rate unless you opt out. 
Right. That, that forces them to, to get into something which is for their own good. That's exactly what we've talked about here. And I think we should do that. Joe. Um, on your small business uh, premium relief, are you sharing that with your employees to lower their health insurance premiums or is the town keeping all of it? The town is. Or it has to be done pro proportional to what they pay into it. So if, uh, if, they're, if they're not, you know, if, if you've got someone that's not paying into the premium, then it comes to the town. If they are paying a percentage of the premium, then prorated, they get a portion of that reduces what they have to pay in. Yeah, but you're allowed to share it with your employees. Right. So whatever they're getting in relief, which I think is $40 a month um, per employee and $25 for dependents, we gave it all to the employees to keep their insurance premiums down. So they're not paying as much in health insurance premiums. Point of clarification, I had not been doing that, Joe, uh, just simply was reducing it off the off the employer's contribution. Um, but if that's something, you know, this is a new program that came out on uh, was November of 2021. So it's real, real new. Um, and certainly we could, you know, if that's the wish of the board to, you know, share that relief with the employees, you know, for those that have um, the the premium relief for a single adult, you know, is $50 and there's no contribution on the employee for that. So that would stay with the town. Two adults, it's $100. And we're talking monthly. One adult with child or children is $80. And two adults and child and children is 130 So right. um, perhaps we need to have that as an agenda item at a selectman's meeting. I mean, how, how are you accounting for it now? Are you counting it as revenue for the town? No, I'm just reducing our monthly bill from Harvard Pilgrim by those, by because they actually do it off our bill. Right. So they put it right on the monthly bill that, you know, this is what the amount is for the main business COVID relief uh, as a deduction from the premium, the monthly premium. So that's what I've been doing. I think you've got to, you've got to check the, the actual statute on that because... If they're if they're paying a if they're paying a, purport, a percentage of the premium, which they are in, in some cases, then a percentage of that has to go towards reducing what they're paying toward that. Right. Which is what we're doing. We're just giving it all back to the employee. Whatever they get designated for, we just give it back to them to reduce their monthly premium. But we can we can definitely take a look at that. And if it's statutorily outlined, then we can certainly you know, make the adjustments and make that right back, you know, to the inception. Uh, I believe you're allowed to keep some of it for administrative costs. Well, we'll look into it. And if that's the wish, I mean, if that's the intent of the, of the program and, and certainly the wish of the board, we, we can do that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out, Joe. We have last questions for employee benefits. Let's go to Tiff. Yeah, the, the big change there is the uh, putting the fiber network infrastructure from the CIP into the TIF and the network hardware updates. And that was something, as I said, that uh, Sharice suggested. We checked the TIF, you know, documents, and so that's allowable expense. And and uh, I think I think we also had a confirmation on that from our uh, municipal. Uh, Attorney. attorney that, that handles the specialist in TIF, just to be sure, because we've you know had some questions on TIFs before, but uh, so that works fine, and that's what we did. I don't know if you want to add anything else, Sharice, but uh, no, it's pretty much the same, other than those two changes. The uh, let's see, one of the organizations, the Fourth Hawthorne. Um, organization, you know, reverted back to their $1,000 request versus the 2000. Um, so that was our reduction that they had, you know, put forth. And yeah, other than that, um, I know there's going to be some TIF discussion with our assessor and the board of selectmen at their next meeting. 
I need to get some numbers for Kurt on, um, you know, was, we're not really making full use of our TIF and it expires, I believe in 2030, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so he's got some, you know, he, some suggestions, you know, through the work of, you know, with a legal firm on maybe some new ideas on, um, you know, what we can do with it. So more information to come, but I thought this was a good way to, you know, reduce the general fund operating budget and make better use of our TIF. Any TIF questions? I stand corrected. I'm looking at the TIF document right now. It's a 30 year TIF and uh, year 30 is 20, 2028. So we still have six years left to make use of it. But so I do stand corrected for that 2028, not 2030. No questions for TIFF. Let's move on to revenues. The story there is uh, the state revenue sharing, you know, increase, which is substantial. Uh, we also have some increases in uh, um, revenues that are coming in from other municipalities for services we're providing. Nate and I are actually trying to market the services that we can provide with our mechanic to the communities to the west of us, being Casco and Naples are maybe stepping into public works. Naples thought they were going to public works uh, more fully than they are, but that ended up not passing their town meeting. I think Casco has a has an initiative coming up to add some staff. And so they become good customers in terms of used equipment. And we're hoping that they might become, you know, people who we, or towns that we would provide services to. But right now we are doing some roadside mowing. You may recall we bought a substantial tractor mowing machine. So from the revenue that we're getting from that machine, you know, where, and, uh, you know, the cost of paying them paying the operator and so forth, that is something that's been a benefit to us. And, and so we have the machine as well. So, so we're trying to regionalize and cooperate with our neighbors and we're making some, some progress on that actually. So we have some capacities they don't. And so that's something we can, we can use as a revenue. Any other questions on revenue? Sure, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think uh, talking with Sue, it's typically in the month of June that the selectmen look at the fee schedule on an annual basis. So I do know in talking with our animal control officer, um, she had, you know, just, you know, when I was meeting with her and talking about, you know, I'm trying to dissect the revenues, you know, for the town on, you know, where, where that comes from. We really don't collect a lot in impound fees. And I think she was even making the suggestion that we look at increasing those, uh, when the time comes, um, maybe not so much for the first offense, but for the second and third offense. And, um, as we had alluded to earlier, you know, code enforcement permit revenue is up and it was a modest increase uh, to 100,000. And, you know, I do expect motor vehicle excise tax to, you know, continue uh, growing, you know, it's based on the MSRPs and the MSRPs of vehicles right now are really significant. So um, I might've been a little low on that level, um, but those are the basic changes. Um, and as uh, Dawn had mentioned, you know, doing some work for other municipalities and bringing in revenue from that, as well as, um, you know, we're taking on snow plowing for the school district right. uh, as well. That's a new endeavor. Well, it's a new old one. We, we did it before. <laughs> right. We're doing it under a revised uh, program that more, of, before we did it as almost to some degree as a courtesy. Now it's, now it's priced you know, more like it would be if they were getting a contracted private service. So I think it's working out for both entities. They're probably saving a bit and, and we, we have a revenue and we're, we're doing well with that, given our cost to do it. Can I ask a question about 
the plowing uh, contract and where that's going. That is P and K going away. P and K. Yeah, they've, they've gone away. They've gone away. Yeah, a few, some time ago. Yeah, I don't know how many years that's been, but it's been a, a few. So we, we, basically, what we did is we 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 over time we had less and less P and K service, and then I don't know now if it was seems like it was about three or four years ago, we ended up buying some trucks from Vermont and taking this whole thing on ourselves. And I think Nate and the crew have done a really good job with that. You know, we've had our ups and downs. Uh, this has been a tough year for equipment, but but we haven't had P&K for some time now. Okay. Yeah. You know, we were gravitating to, to that direction. Uh, I didn't know that it had been completed already. Yeah, well, right. Well, we kind of needed it back, so that maybe may have been a little confusing, but we jumped in you know, feet first a few years ago. And I think it's worked out pretty well. I, from my standpoint, it has, I mean, I'm looking at the condition of the roads. I, I don't know if Teresa wants to say anything. She's made a particular point in calling this out, I think to the board, but yeah, I think they're doing a good job of it. Any other questions for revenue? Let's go to public safety, animal control. Now on animal control, I think there was a, uh, a little bit of a misstep by us, meaning Sharice and Don. I don't know if Sharice invited Jessica Jackson, our ACO officer. Is, is that correct? I did not. It was af an afterthought on my part this evening was to, you know, I should have emailed her her budget, even though she proposed it to the town of Casco and we share the cost of the animal control with uh, Casco and Naples uh, equally, you know, one third. And, but she could speak to her budget that she presented to the town manager of Casco. And it would probably make sense, Bob, if you don't mind um, moving that to the next agenda so I can send her the budget and uh, have her speak to that at the next meeting. She, yeah, she's, she's aware of the budget. I mean, so it's a third of the budget that we talked about. I just about. didn't invite her. Sue, you know, I'd have I know, I know. Sue. I know. And, she, and she would want to be here. So that was our, that's our era. So. Yeah. Apologize for that. If we can put her on the next meeting, that would be what we'd want to do. Any other questions for animal control? I will tell you that on animal control, one thing we did this year, it's in the process of being done, is that we have now upgraded the vehicle. The one that we had for the past several years is on the, it's at the end of life in terms of uh, <laughs> functionality. So it's on life support even. So. We, you may have noticed a, a black Ford Explorer. Some of you might've got your budget materials out of it, but that came out of a, a local PD. And so we bought it through a broker and, and that's gonna be the new car. And that's also a one third share each town and it'll be marked up soon. And the equipment, we had to get that particular year and model The last year was 19 because the equipment from the 14 will go right into the 19. So that's what we're gonna do, flip the equipment, the specialized, it, you take out the back and it's all lined with aluminum and. It's got a pneumatic door, all this other stuff for animal control. It, it originally came out of the state police, the equipment. So anyway, that's what we're gonna do is flip it into the new car, but this is the last one we can do it with. And then we have to buy new equipment because it won't fit anything else. But well, this should take us through several more years though. Cherise? Yes, Bob. Uh, one other point on the animal control uh, budget is that this is another example. There was a line item for vehicle maintenance under the animal control budget that is now since been moved from this department over to the public works department. Um, I think you'll find, I think recreation might have been the other one that had vehicle maintenance in it. And it just makes sense to pull it, put it all into public works. They have the mechanic, you know, they're buying the parts, and the, you know, they have the tools and whatnot. Uh, again, um, the exception would be, you know, public safety and, and the, you know, the repairs to the, all the fire apparatus and whatnot. So that has been removed from this budget as well and put into public works. So you will see that, but we'll invite uh, Jessica for the next meeting, March 15th, and have her speak to, um, you know, the actual um, interlocal agreement with the town of Casco at the next meeting. Yeah, the other thing I would say, and I don't know if this is going to happen or not, but Cumberland County is looking at a larger regional effort. And uh, we're also now being approached by other towns. 
and we're even doing some limited fee service for Harrison. So there's a potential that it's going to require additional staffing, but there's a potential if it makes economic sense that we might broaden the effort either through the county or through our you know, consortium that we formed. Right now, we're getting a lot of inquiries from our surrounding towns because they can't find or keep anybody in this job, and we've been able to do that. So, so it does make sense to work regionally, but only if uh, you know it's going to be economic sense as well. So it's kind of studying that possibility in two different ways. Teresa. Teresa, I know you pulled the vehicle out of um, animal control, but you're still billing the other two towns for any work we're doing, correct? That is correct. Yeah. Um, you know, the vehicle that we just purchased and, you know, the, well, taking equipment out, putting it back in, we'll be invoicing, you know, Casco and Naples, you know, for their share of the, the new vehicle and the outfitting of it, so to speak, you know, with the cage and whatnot. And when, you, and when you buy a vehicle from us, Teresa, of course, it comes with a service plan. So we're, our, we're servicing the car, we're taking care of the car, which is, you know, something that is a bill back to the other two towns for their share. Okay. Yep. But help support the mechanic position as well, I mm -hmm. think. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the fire department. Hello. Get my material back up. There we go. Uh, thank you for all being here for this budget process. We appreciate the guidance and the help that we've been given. Uh, Sharice and Don, Deputy Goslin, for your assistance in producing this budget, particularly. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, there's new faces here. I'm Bruce Tupper, I'm the Department Chief, uh, EMA Director, and 911 Addressing Officer. And I'm pleased to provide you with this budget overview tonight. Uh, the mission of the fire department is to help people provide comprehensive emergency services, inspection prevention programs, training, and professional development of our members, uh, and to overall assure the health of our members. Uh, now, as we develop this budget, we realize how sick everybody is of hearing about COVID, but unfortunately, it has to be somewhat of our focus tonight. We have a smaller than ever group of people doing this job now. Um, our call department is down to six people with two seasonal students are doing the job of what we had 20 people doing just two years ago. COVID exacerbated this gap in our coverage with members who are unwilling to take the risk of getting sick or bring it home to their families, et cetera. Um, some who may have just been on the edge of burnout who have left and we've had some other health issues with our members, which have caused some long time and very valuable folks to uh, turn in resignations because they just can't physically complete the job anymore, unfortunately. Um, we're also seeing, because of this, uh, an increase in psychiatric patients. Violent calls are more the norm now than the exception. Twice we've had patients jump from moving ambulances. Uh, just recently we had a third try it. Um, that one didn't make it to the hospital. Yes, didn't make it out of the ambulance that was moving. Uh, a recent uh, incident with an intoxicated person at an accident scene tried to move their car with our provider standing right beside his car and wedged between another one. He had to climb on the hood to get away from it, got nicked by the mirror. And the only thing that stopped this person was the fact that our ambulance was behind them and they struck it and were unable to proceed. So we're seeing a lot more of this. It's a lot more dangerous. We're seeing a lot, a lot of weapons and substance abuse in general, along with aggressiveness, both physically and verbally towards our providers. Unfortunately, none of this helps us gain call department members because no one wants to subject themselves to that kind of behavior or risk as a hobby, anyways. Um, to put it into perspective, every department everywhere is going through this. The main chiefs have written a letter to the governor. You've probably seen some of the, the info on that. It's been on the news. Uh, trying to spark some kind of funding um, and fix for the whole thing. There really isn't anything that's quickly on the horizon, unfortunately. We're seeing a huge increase in open call shifts. We're also seeing a big increase in call volume. We're up about 34% right now. Unfortunately, we're also unable or only able to meet the NFPA standards of six in, uh, people on scene within 15 minutes, about 24% of the time now. 
And we are fully staffed with our firefighter paramedics and our firefighter EMTs. The problem that we're experiencing there is we've had uh, a lengthy outage for a health reason, and now we have an FMLA outage. And it's absolutely killing us with overtime costs because we're having to force paramedics in to work the shifts. Something we don't like doing, but unfortunately we're having to do. So twice a week we're forcing someone to cover a 24 hour shift. And that's all the time. Okay. Um, so when I talk about, you know, increasing responsibilities and such, I, I just need to kind of touch on this one particular day that we had this morning and all these incidents happened or were toned out within like a five minute period, 15 minute period of time. We had five ambulances in our town covering calls. Uh, and you're going to say, hey, well, at least you covered them. Well, here's the real story behind it. The first call went out, we covered it. The second call went out right behind it, Casco came in. Third call went out and the Wyndham truck came in. Wyndham only had one truck left. Casco had no more trucks left. We had nothing left to prove. We ended up with two other towns coming in and it took them over 20 minutes to get here because it, were not, it was not our surrounding communities, if you will. We had to go beyond that to get this, the resources. The unfortunate piece is for them to cover the calls in their town, they also had to reach further out and they were 20 plus minute responses on some critical calls, which is unacceptable. Our system, it is breaking, there's no doubt. Um, and I, I find that when you have a critical call, 20 minutes to get an ambulance to the scene is, is just unreasonable and un very undesirable if it was me on the other end of the services that were needed. So what we've done is we've, we've put together a plan that has some changes in it, payroll uh, changes, and that's based upon a, a union negotiation, which will be uh, talked about more at the select board meeting and executive session. We've included some of those, uh, the base pay rates as proposed in our budget. So at least there's something there to work with um, at this point. We've also been talking and have been working with our, our mutual aid towns as we have done for years, uh, regionally, if you want to look at it that way. It's a regional approach to providing services. Six departments that are working together have agreed to standardize pay for our per diems so that we're not in competition with each other. In other words, it's like a shell game. We talk about it every year. One pays the dollar more and everybody goes there. They're per diem people, so they're looking for the money. And then you lose your staff, and then you decide to up yours and pay a dollar twenty-five. They all come back, and then someone else pays a buck fifty, and we lose them again. Uh, it's just the uh, nature of the beast when it comes to the pediums. They're all part-time people, so we're looking to create a pool, standardize qualifications, and pay with these six towns, uh, which will create a pool of personnel to pick from, if you will. We're hoping that that will have some effect on uh, filling some of the shifts that we that we have open and being able to provide adequate coverage to our to our citizens and safer coverage with our people. The savings is not only in the staff, but uh, also would be in turnout here as uh, we realize that people are working for multiple towns. If we have a standardized set of turnout here and a Velcro on name on the back, Lincoln Gray, Raymond, whatever, they can put a new Velcro patch on and we all share in the cost with that here. Uh, not only that, we're looking at our mutual aid incidents and automatic mutual aid is a, is a buzzword that gets thrown around. It means that it's not something you get to the scene and decide you need help with. You, you call for it immediately on the dispatch. We don't even call for it built into our response plan. Now we have to also consider at this point that even that's kind of failing because everybody's busier. So we've got more calls, less people and more towns involved. But we're also reaching out and asking for this help automatically on smaller calls. Throw out the car accident because that's where it's gone recently. We're starting to see towns ask, can we put an engine company on for a car accident? And that's the boat we're all in. We're trying to help each other out. We're also working together with this group for training. And we're putting together and combining our training efforts and resources. And we're currently sharing the cost as well as instructional staff to put on a main bureau of labor standards firefighter certification class where we will instruct 15 new firefighters throughout a bigger region than the six towns, but uh, it's, it's still a, a step in the right direction. And this will give them the opportunity to test and to certify at that level. Make them available for our labor pool. 
again, it's just that first step and it's the very basic of basics for firefighter certification. Um, Cover that. Um, we're all facing the uncertainty of uncontrollable and skyrocketing costs. As you know, things are absolutely haywire right now. Uh, our gear vendor sent out an announcement today. They had sent one out about six months ago. They had gone up 3%. They're going up another 5%. And it's from the factory, not from the vendor. Uh, I just heard from the ambulance vendor that we buy our ambulances from generally. <laughs> I said expect a $30,000 basically increase in the cost of that vehicle. Fire apparatus is absolutely done the same thing. We're looking at 20 and 30% uh, changes quickly in that, and they're talking double changes in a year's time. It's due to the metals. It's due to the, the, uh, the technology components in those vehicles. One, the supply chain, but two, the value of them. And that's just gone crazy with inflation. So with the impact of the supply costs, we even question that we've put in enough to uh, hopefully stay within our bottom line in this budget for fuel, fuel, oil, heating, things like that. I'm confident that payroll that we're okay in that area. And that's where you're seeing our biggest increase. Uh, we do have a few other increases in there. There's a couple of decreases as well. As Mr. Willard alluded earlier, we've put in for assistance to firefighter grant for the SAFER Act uh, to the federal government. Um, that staff would if it's funded in its entirety, and if the board accepts it, we provide eight total staff. And you cringe when you hear, oh my God, we're adding eight more full-time staff. But when you put it into perspective, it only provides two people per shift because we work 24-7, 365. Um, we would wait on or propose that we wait to fund the two additional persons that we put in the budget until after we hear from the federal government if we're going to get this grant or not. Um, I think it will be about September-ish when we do start to hear uh, when grants are awarded or not. So it's not that far out. However, um, we also do feel that two people is probably short-sighted and really should be four people at this time just due to the lack of call members. Um, something that may be able to be fixed in the future with training, with newer interests, with new recruiting, but we're seeing that decline everywhere and I'm not so optimistic that we're gonna suddenly have this uh, surge of people who wanna become fire and EMS people. If we did, it would take over two years to get them trained and up to standards and efficient and working on their own. Uh, so it's a long-term turnaround. On the CIP budget, um, unfortunately, I have to apologize on this one. Um, I, we automatically have a $75,000 uh, ambulance fee for replacement that goes into that account every year. And I didn't put it on my form and Sharice didn't know I, being new to it. And um, I think I did it last year too, actually. But So I didn't include that and I just assumed it would be an automatic thing. So I did not include that in there, but we should include that in there because it is for the ambulance replacement and our ambulance will be due for replacement next year. We extended it out another year from last year. And um, um, unfortunately, extending it costs more in the long run, but um, I, I think we have to plan on it for next year. We have the uh, proposal in there for a $730,000 expense, and that is uh, a truck that would replace two and put one basically into a reserve status to pre preserve it for another five, seven years, somewhere in that area. So utility seven, um, a truck that's a 20-year-old pumper. It was an extrication vehicle until it didn't carry enough equipment that we needed, so we bought the squad truck used to put that in service. The problem is we had to start looking at things reality-wise now with the lacking staff, um, and we can't roll three trucks out the door in a car crash during the day without adding staff. So in order to cover a car crash, we need to put together a vehicle that would do 80% of what these other two vehicles could do currently. So we added or looked at the concept of a rescue pumper and that's a truck that's, it's designed specifically, as it says, it's a rescue pumper. So it really covers the needs of a squad truck, which is the extrication vehicle, technical rescue vehicle, carries your ropes, <laughs> high angle, water rescue, ice suits, as well as 
fire apparatus that can do fire suppression activity. We we'll carry the large diameter supply hose, the same as a regular engine company, but would create a situation where one truck, one engine rather, could roll out with an ambulance and handle most of our car crash incidents. We've had situations where we're dead manning trucks on scene. That means we're leaving a truck sitting beside the road with no one around it until someone can come from wherever they're at, pick the thing up. Sometimes it's public works, sometimes it's our guys coming from their work. And uh, it's just the unfortunate situation at times. This is happening more often. Um, I, it was very ironic, but right after we started putting together our plans and meeting with vendors and the vendors engineers to start designing this truck to meet the needs of this community and the needs, needs of this department, uh, I spoke with Chief Libby and Widom and he said, we're doing the same thing and we're combining two into one and for the same exact reason. Uh, so they have actually beat us to the punch. They've ordered the truck and it should be in in probably another 18, 20 some months because that's what it's taking to get these vehicles now. Um, I've also heard to the great pine and have to just confirm it, but uh, Bertie told me the other day that uh, Casco is doing the very same thing. Uh, we're all in the same boat and we're looking at how can we respond more effectively, more efficiently, and, and handle the incidents that we have safely and provide safety to the public as well as to our own, our own folks. Um, that's where we are with that. So that was an expense there for this year, but in reality, I believe there's no vendor that's gonna be able to provide that particular vehicle. If we ordered it July 1, they wouldn't be able to provide it in that next year. It would be just over the year mark. So it's gonna push it out uh, two, two budget cycles, basically, unless we get extremely lucky. Um, Back onto the rescue truck, actually, I got to cover this too, but uh, one of the things that we're designing it with is a, is a higher tech uh, rescue equipment for extrication tools. One of the big things that we find is our hydraulics are old now and they do need to be replaced, but technology has proven to be our friend. Battery equipment now, one is easier to use. You don't have to have a hydraulic pump, cart that and hose lines around with you to run that piece of equipment. And we're more effective with the battery tools because believe it or not, a battery tool is more effective and efficient and stronger, if you will, than the hydraulic tools that we're accustomed to. So the stuff that we have that has 30, 40,000 PSI cutting strength at the tip can shatter more on steel uh, is being outnumbered by battery equipment. And the longevity of the batteries is greatly improved. And the tools that we actually have our sights on can take a regular D-wall battery, it's a 24 volt battery, so it's not a super expensive battery. Uh, that's just one example of what we're looking at with this vehicle. When I use the term rescue pumper, I think it's important for you to understand too that, that the cabinetry on this vehicle is set up differently and it's engineered to handle this equipment. The tanks on a truck are usually a T-shaped water tank. This is an L-shaped tank. Ladders will sit on edge and go sideways through the tank area. Um, totally enclosed, it just makes a better and a safer vehicle in the end. Um, we really do believe that engine one would be preserved for quite some time after that and still be a viable piece of equipment. Now, when I talk about this, the utility seven truck, that's one of them being replaced. Uh, it has been out of service for over 60 days this year alone due to mechanical issues. These are ongoing and repetitive issues with fuel systems and electrical issues. Uh, for the past two years, it has not passed its mandated UL pump test. Barely, we'll sneak by, but it has not passed it officially. So uh, it basically has to be a D-rated pump. And uh, it's because of mechanical issues with the truck, not the actual pump. So we're entering into that phase with that vehicle being that age that it, it just needs to be considered at this point for replacement. One point I... Just realized that I forgot when I'm talking about the payroll. Um, that's our biggest increase. And the um, thing that's important to mention in there is that not only is the union's uh, potential bargaining agreement amounts in there, but also the 90000 for the two personnel. And our administrative assistant was an additional uh, expense for this year when we added her uh, just just last season, but uh, 
she's 30 hours a week and it's basically $30,000 of that increase as well. So I'm kind of wrapping it all up. Um, again, thank you. And I, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions to fire? Teresa. Um, Bruce, you're putting in for two additional full-time people. Correct. Okay, and I think Don had said something that a grant, yeah, too, is going to cover yeah. that too. You are coming down on different um, items. Aren't you going to have to pay for stuff for these two new people? There, there is some items that we've come down on. We're also looking at the uh, a little bit better, even though the like the cost of the turnout gear may be going up. We're looking at better buying power by standardizing our equipment across six towns and being able to buy more in bulk. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're looking at. We are a little bit nervous about the other expenses. As I said earlier, um, there's so much unknown out there right now. I, I can't tell you that that same turnout coat we're spending a thousand dollars on tomorrow, maybe 12. No, right, right. That's why I'm surprised that. to see that you came down, yeah. especially with two people, yeah. so. Yeah, there are certain things we did. I think we went up, uh, we went up in heating. Um, I don't know what our fuel costs are going to be yet. Um, we're trying to gather some intel from our surrounding towns ourselves and see what those departments are, are going to do. Um, and talking with a friend today in Wyndham, he said that they're they're planning on a fairly significant fuel increase in the fire department, like 30, 40 cents a gallon minimum. So they're, they're going to approach that in their budget. Um, it, it's, I don't know. I just don't know where it's going to go. Nope. Right. This war is just compounded now, and that's the, the thing that's making me so uneasy. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sincerely hoping we can fit everything within our line item. We try every year, we try. <laughs> Any other questions for fire? Okay, let's go on to emergency management. I'll keep mine on then. Okay. <laughs> there is no specific budget for emergency management. It is lumped in underneath the fire department. Um, so that's basically where that all falls. Um, working with the COVID stuff, we, we got a 15 plus thousand dollar reimbursement out of the federal government. We're currently working on a smaller one than that um, because uh, a lot of things became very much free to us. Uh, so a lot of our turnout equipment, not turnout, but protective equipment for a while became free through the emergency management agency at the state. And we took advantage of that, got masks and gowns, et cetera, all with no cost. So, uh, we don't have a great deal of, of money that we can collect, but uh, obviously we're working on that actively and we'll continue as long as the feds are paying. We'll put together a plan to get it back from I don't see any questions, Chief. All right. Thank you. Um, I've been asked asked to add debt services to this agenda. What's that? It's the fire department. For the fire department. Do you want to speak about it? Oh, you might as well take it as a whole, Bob. Okay. <laughs> All right, debt service. So based on what the um, fire CIP has in its uh, reserve account presently, I suggested that you know we not take any more than 230,000 out of that. It will it will be after it's Funded the seventy-five thousand. It will be at three hundred and thirteen thousand come the end of fiscal year twenty-two. So I made the suggestion not to totally deplete it, and then finance the five hundred thousand for the new rescue pumper over a ten-year period. Um, as you know, interest rates are on the rise, but I do have uh, I did get a couple of estimates on what that would cost um, per year. Uh, to finance the 500000 for 10 years, keeping in mind the interest rates more than likely will go up. Uh, I did, you know, the, um, the bonds that we have outstanding, they're going to mature in FY26. 
Uh, one has a declining principal balance and the other one, uh, I don't know what the financing term is it, you know, for to be consistent from one year to the next level. I think she's frozen. Yeah. There she is. No. Rose up. She's Sorry, in my back. Yes. So, um, and the other debt is there. So that that's basically it. The new debt for the new Rusker pumper. Um, is included there. Well, yeah, Don, um, at what dollar level are we, should we be looking at bond, at looking at self-bonding instead of going to the, going to the bond bank or whatever, like we did before? I mean, if we're looking at it, you got a half million dollars on, on the fire truck. If we've got other items, are we better off to look at consolidating a total bond and going out and bonding against ourselves because we've got we still have the triple a rating so last time we beat the we beat the bond bank by about a point and a half yeah that's a great question um i, I think in general you know that the, there's a using the bond bank is going to probably be a higher rate an easier process it's a more you know i guess complicated process by issuing our own bonds but you do have that benefit in the the rates that you get, particularly with our, you know, AAA bond rating. So um, I, I think the larger issues are probably, should always probably be, you know, local issues. And uh, if you wanted to consider, we, we do consider actually, we do use uh, actual bank financing for real short-term stuff. But I, I think the, the fire truck is, is significant enough where it may be something we want to, you know, issue ourselves, if that's the question. But we, we well, would probably want to analyze it one against the other, you know? Yeah. So it's figure out what's the best thing to do is, but in the past it has been to use our rating and to get the uh, better, you know, better, uh, I guess, financing that way. There are, there are costs, you know, you got to add the costs in there, yeah. there are costs to that, that you don't have with the main bond bank. So uh, I, I think we should do an analysis and, and see which is better, but it's probably going to be bonding ourselves. Any other questions on debt service? I see none. Public comment? Do we have any public out there? The only one that would qualify as public would be Bob Champ Jones. Okay. And, and Bob Jones has been invited to, uh, I guess, be a part of the committee subject to selectmen appointment i don't see his picture there but he's he's there i think there he is hey, bob thanks um what's that i don't let's go to budget finance committee comments do we have any dennis well, I'm just curious when the chief talked about the rescue, does that get added in automatically because it was missed or do we have, is that, how, how does that process work? This 75,000 that's usually in the CIP for it that was eliminated or missed? We would make an, we would make an adjustment. I mean, that was a, an error between the, the request and the, and the finance office. So we, we would put that back into the next iteration of the budget. Yeah. Okay, I'm just curious. And of course, it's all subject to, to review and approval by the board, but there are going to be some adjustments up and down. This is a particularly uh, peculiar year that way. I mean, we, as I said, we've got to figure out what we're going to do when the library comes in about that. And, you know, we get, we've, I think we have some things that we can, you know, talk about taking out of this budget for sure. But, uh, but that's going to be, I guess, when we get to the del deliberative process, I have some suggestions on that, but we're not there yet. But it oh, so the that, this one's an error omission, the correction of an error omission. Well, well, the reason I ask that question is if if we're going to be looking at a, a, a 
a combination engine rescue and also an ambulance and going along with the previous question of bonding. Would you put those two together? You could do that. I mean, if you're talking about that same length of time or whatever, it's just, would that be the, uh, uh, you know, the right time to do that? The, the question I would have for the chief would be, I mean, on an ambulance, you typically would have a, you know, at least a 10, maybe a 15 year bond is what's the life of the ambulance. It's more like 10, right? Right. So I, think, I think if you could do that in a 10 year bond, that might make sense. As Ralph just pointed out, I mean, to do, figure out which is the best way to go. Maybe you should put those two capital labs together. Possibly. Thank you. But we can look at that as a way to, you know, spread out the, the cost and, and reduce the budget. Thank you. Good, good suggestion, Dennis, I think. Any other budget, budget finance community comments? Any select board comments? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. <laughs> All those in favor? Thank you. See you at the next finding meeting. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>